Hi, Dr. Chandra. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very yes, much. Yes. Uh, yeah. We are here waiting for your lecture. Uh, with great pleasure to have Dr. Praveen Chandra. Okay. And yes, two lectures from you. And uh, we have a good panel of physicians, uh, Dr. Jairam from UAE and Dr. Uh, uh, Ochala from Poland and uh, uh, from Dr. Ortega from Ecuador. Okay, so that's a very international uh, scene over there. <laughs> yeah, from 32 countries, 168 people yeah. I have. Oh, oh my God, I should have been there. Anyway, so good morning to all of you and welcome to India. So today morning I am going to share with you the results of the Marie's One study which was a six month uh, clinical and angiographic IVAS and OCT outcomes with a thin strut PLLA based drug, elut uh, drug eluting bioabsorbable vascular scaffold in patients with CAD. So why do we need one? So the situation is this that uh, we are seeing successes with BRS now and the reality is that we are using it in our day-to-day -day practice uh, for the last three, four years. However, taking into consideration that uh, it was a first generation device and so it, it is still, I will say, BRS is still in the developmental phase and hence we need something to improve on this and uh, that is why we have this another one from India. This is the Mary's tent and it is basically that the previous device which we had, had certain issues. One is the thick struts, high profile, special tips and tricks for implantation. And let me tell you, we have, we have been evolving on the special tips and tricks for the last four years now. Because earlier it was a three P's for implantation, then it became five P's. And now the US physicians are here in this audience. They know that it is now PSP. So, that is one, uh, you know, evolution which is happening with the implantation of this device. And uh, the other problem is that there is limited expansion characteristics. That you can't expand the stent beyond 0.5 millimeter of the uh, prescribed size. For example, if you are implanting a 3 millimeter absorb, then you can't take it beyond 3.5. There is limited accessibility to side branches in many situations. However, we have access side branches. We have done uh, bifurcation stenting with various techniques including tap. And the low radio opacity of the stent is another problem because there are only two small markers at the end of the stent. So sometimes it becomes really difficult to figure out what exactly is happening with the stent inside once you implant it. The radial strength, again, you know, although it is uh, recommended that the radial strength is uh, what is required, but still we are a little uncertain, especially in calcified and fibrotic vessels. There are concerns about uh, more concerns and now even more concerns about scaffold thrombosis at various times, including the recent issue coming from absorb 2 of the very late strain thrombosis. And another last issue of limited sizes of lengths and diameters. So in diffuse disease or long lesions, we have to use many of these devices. Then how do you size them both in terms of diameter and the length? And then certainly it becomes a limitation when we are treating complex coronary disease patients which are very common these days in everybody's practice who is sitting there. So which means we need a next generation device 
and it also happened with the evolution of drug eluting stents earlier and now it is happening with the bioabsorbable scaffold. This is Mary's 100 which is developed in India which is a serolimus eluting bioabsorbable vascular scaffold and as you can see here that there are markers which are more than one. There are one, two, the three sets of two markers each at the end of the stent both proximally and distally. So which means when you implant this you will see three markers instead of one as you saw in absorb. So here the structure or the geometry of the stent is that it is a hybrid cell design with open cells in the middle and the closed cell at the end of the stents. There is a sca backbone PLLA scaffold which is 100 microns in, uh, you know, in the, the strut thickness. There is a drug coat of PDLLA and serolimus which is 1.25 micrograms per square millimeters which is the drug illusion and as I told you there are couple, couplets of triaxial RO, RO markers at either end of the stent. Now for the side branches as you see here that these uh, holes the optimal side branch access can be done through these uh, strut spaces. So this is how it looks uh, this 100 micron device compared to a 150 micron absorbed. So these are the boxes you see on OCT with absorb and these are the size of boxes you see with 100 microns. So the difference you can now figure out how much it is. So probably it can have its implications on the stent thrombosis in the initial phase and also in the late phase when these struts are getting embedded inside the vessel wall. It goes through a six trench guiding catheter for all sizes because the average profile, profile of a 1.25 millimeter or for 3 millimeter is this much and uh, now you see that this is the comparison of other bioabsorbable stents which are either in the market or going to be in the market. Most of them are above the 100 micron bar over here. And the you know the Magmaris is again 150. Uh, many of you must have been in, you know involved in the trials with Magmaris. In India also it is going to start very soon. Now the crossing profile again is 1.2 compared to 1.75 of Magmaris and 1.43 of Absorb. I think but with Absorb they have changed the crossing profile when uh, why, because they have used that same uh, you know the balloon which was used in the alpine stent. So this is the study design. This is the first in man safety and efficacy in patients with single de novo coronary lesion up to two vessels treated by a single Mary's 100 scaffold up to 24 millimeter in 108 patients. So the clinical follow-up was completed in six, uh, at six months in this study up till now. The angiographic follow-up was done in 36 patients and OCT follow-up in 13, IVAS follow-up in 12. The diameters used was 2.75, 3 and 3.5 and the lengths used were 19 and 24. The DAPT regimen recommended is up to one year. So this is the key inclusion and exclusion criteria. As you can see that one lesion per target vessel was allowed up to two lesions in native arteries. Reference vessel diameter was 2.75 to 3.5 and lesion length less than 20. And the flow has to be above to me one. And no acute my patients were included who are less than seven days. Crate nine more than 1.3 was excluded any prior PTC or CABG, low ejection fraction, significant calcification and left main or osteal location was also excluded. 
Uh, bifurcation lesions with more than 2 mm side branches were excluded and any severe tortuosity and angulation were also excluded in this study. So what we studied was the, at the primary endpoint, MACE at 6 months, which is cardiac death, MI, TLR and TVR and secondary endpoints of defies in procedure success and scaffold thrombosis. Efficacy was measured as in, for late lumen loss, minimal lumen area Hello? and scaffold and lumen area in terms of percentage volume. Praveen. This is the study uh, leadership. Yeah. Uh, if, you, if you don't mind, we just have to break for 15 minutes. If you don't mind, I'm sorry to put you in this kind of position. Uh, Dr. Cole has a flight to no catch problem. and he's uh, about to leave. If you don't mind, we'll switch over to you uh, no, back not, in not 10 minutes. No problem. No problem. No problem. Thank you very much. I'll Dr. stop Chara. here and then we'll take it forward later on. Thank okay, you. Okay. I appreciate that. Dr. Chandra, would you be so kind and continue your lecture? Yes, sure. So, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, we could easily hear you. Okay. So, these were the investigating sites. As you can see, are 16 investigating sites. And we included 108 subjects uh, in this uh, study. This is the baseline demographics of 108 patients. You can see that the diabetes rate is slightly less compared to our national average of interventional patients, which is about 35 to 40 percent. Dyslipidemia, again, not very high, 13 percent. Hypertension, 40 percent. And uh, patients with MI more than seven days were 34 percent. So this was the overall situation. Ejection fraction average was 50 percent. And most of these vessels were LAD, about one third right coronary artery, and rest was circumflex arteries. There was not any severe calcification or tortuosity, and uh, side branches were involved only in about one third. But still, the lesions were B2, B1 and B2 mostly percent and rest were A and C. So this was 1.07 lesion per patient and the most important thing you must notice here is that the balloon post dilatation was done in 100 percent patients. The device success was 100 percent and this is the outcome we got. As you can see here, this is 100% monitored, CC adjudicated, no cardiac death, no scaffold thrombosis, and no TVR up to six months. So this is the outcome which we were very happy about up till this time. And this is the QC analysis which is uh, showing that the mean in-segment reference vessel diameter was 2.97 and the in-scaffold reference was 3.09. So an in-segment MLD at baseline was 0.92 and at post-procedure was 2.61. And this is the QC analysis at baseline post procedure and six months. The in scaffold diameter stenosis was 12.68% at six months. And the in scaffold reference vessel diameter was 3.06 at six months compared to 3.14 at post procedure. The late lumen loss now you can see here is 0.15 in scaffold, 0.14 in segment, 0 0.07 at proximal edge, and 0 0.06 at distal edge. This is uh, one of the, I think, the best in the BRS, whatever is available up till now. And you can see here that most of these dots actually fall below 0.25 in this uh, chart here where the plotting has been done 
uh, in terms of percentage across this in segment in scaffold late lumen loss at six months. This is one of the representative cases as you can see here, proximal LED, pre-procedure and this is the post dilatation with high pressures using a NC balloon in a 3.519 Mary's stent going to extreme high pressures in the proximal and the distal portions. Now you can see the proximal marker which is matched with the balloon marker and that's how we do it once we are doing a post dilatation. This is the final results post procedure and this is six months. Absolutely no uh, you know, visual late loss as you can see here. And this is the core lab analysis uh, which was uh, showing that 99.3% stents, the stents are covered and the mean flow area at six months is 7.2 post procedure and 6.8 at six months and the flow area is also quite good. So that is how the results were on OCT. These are some of the OCT pictures as you can see here that these are the small these blocks, small boxes compared to the absorbed stent and here you see it follow up that these all these boxes are covered with a layer of tissue. Uh, complete coverage has been demonstrated here. <clears throat> the core lab serial quantitative IVAS analysis again showed that it was very positive in favor of Mary's in terms of both MLA and minimum scaffold area. So to conclude, Mary's one trial is the first human evaluation of a second generation Mary's 100 bioabsorbable scaffold with 100 micron struts demonstrated high acute success and no major adverse clinical events or scaffold thrombosis up to six months. The serial QC analysis demonstrated relatively low late lumen loss, suggesting high efficacy on inhibiting new intimal hyperplasia at late follow-up. And OCT and IVAS subset analysis demonstrates a sustained mean flow area and virtually complete strut coverage, which is 99.3% in this study. And I think that is a very positive outcome which we have seen, which I must call as a second generation stent, uh, the bioabsorbable stent, biodissolving stent. And with this encouraging results, it provides us for the basis of further studies using a wide range of lengths and sizes in more complex and larger patient population. Further on, the Mary's one extend, which is a clinical trial currently recruiting multiple sites Maybe some of you are involved in this. It is a randomized pivotal trial against second generation metallic DS planned for 2017. And this is the future direction of BRS. As you can see in routine PCI, left main, peripheral circulation, upper limb, lower limb, renal, everywhere. This is going to be studied subsequently, including the intracranial arteries. So with this new platform and new device, probably we are ushering into a new era of bioabsorbable scaffolds, uh, which are going to be safer, more effective, and easier to implant. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Praveen. And thank you also for your understanding when you allowed us to sort of cut short your talk uh, for uh, Dr. Cole. We had a wonderful presentation here and I'm sure we're no looking uh, into the next generation and the future of uh, bio revascular, you know, reabsorbable and vascular scaffolds. Thank you for that. In the interest of time, I think we will uh, stop this session here and uh, all the very best to you and your team, sir. Okay. Thank you so much again. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very Thank much. You.